once again. This is Nuance, and I'm Mike Scala, joined, as always, by Jay Carter, also known as Timid, the hip-hop artist and the chair of BLM Tokyo. What's going on, Jay? Uh, you know, kind of a, it's a, a lottery-type day. A lottery-type day? What's up with that? You know, the, the, the news about Trump and Santos, the same day. <laughs> Those are two for your bingo card, right? Yeah, man. It's a good thing. How about yeah. yourself? What's going on with yeah, you? Like it's almost deja vu because a few weeks ago, we had that same kind of feeling when it was indictment day, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, that you know, hopefully it's a, it's a step, you know, it's a step in the right direction and, uh, you know, we can... Uh, get some good traction on this and other other wrongs that need to be uh, addressed. That's right. As we say, it's a glimmer of hope, but the world can use more of that, right? We'll take whatever victory we can get. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I introduced myself as Mike Scala. I guess I should say the award-winning Mike Scala, if I want to be that kind of guy, which I'm not, but it's always fun, right? Uh, you know, I've mentioned some of these I've gotten in the past, really never used to get awards like this, but I did get a series of them as of late. And I'm very appreciative of that. Last night, I actually got one from the mayor of New York City, Mr. Eric Adams. Now, those who are familiar with our show know we don't always see eye to eye on everything, all the decisions that the mayor makes. But you know what? He is still the mayor of New York City. And it's always good to get recognized. And this actually is a really nice one. Here it says, for your outstanding volunteer efforts in 2022, our city rises on the foundation of the millions of New Yorkers who power the five boroughs, support our diverse population, and forge our bright future. It is important that we publicly recognize those who have devoted their lives to elevating others. You have worked tirelessly to support communities in need and uplift your fellow New Yorkers, and in doing so have created lasting positive change in our city. You are helping us achieve our goal of building a fairer, more equitable, and inclusive future for all. And we are proud to applaud your extraordinary commitment to service. So it's always nice to get something like this. Yeah, man. Congratulations. I saw I saw you uh, posted that up on um, one of your social media accounts. So no, yeah, it's awesome. Instagram and Facebook. Yeah, that's awesome. For your outstanding volunteer efforts in 2022. I'm going to use this now when people say, oh, I didn't see you enough last year. Where were you when, when you were busy doing your... Cases. I was out there. Even the mayor said I had extraordinary effort. You didn't see me, but the mayor did. What? That's right. That's right. It's on record now. It's me on the wall soon. Yeah. Should make a T-shirt out of that. Just. Yeah. Right. That's a, a very all over, thing to do. All over print design. Maybe I will. Here. I'm out here. <laughs> Outstanding volunteer efforts in 2022. Quote unquote, Mayor Adams. Yeah. I mean, this is really well written. I mean, this is something that you, you might want to put on your tombstone, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so this I wanted to show you because you actually helped out with this. This arrived in the mail today. Nice, nice. Now, this was a Lions Club mailer, and it went to every household in Howard Beach, Ozone Park, and Woodhaven, which is significant because that's a geographical area that this Lions Club covers. And what it is, is really, it's a notice for seniors in these communities that if they need help with grocery shopping, running errands, companionship, social events, whatever it is, to reach out to us, and we will be able to provide that assistance for free, absolutely free. Plus, I will mention that there's a Lions Club Leo's division forming, which is for 12 to 18-year-old volunteers. So if you're a student or if you know a student who needs those service hours, you can reach out to us as well. And we'll get that for you. So really a great service to the community. Like I said, everyone got it in Howard Beach, Ozone Park, and Woodhaven. And on the back, you see the sponsors. These are the people and businesses who sponsored the mail and paid for it to go out. And so I was able to get a a quarter page uh, ad in there. And we are advertising wills, which is a new thing for my practice. But there were people who asked me, um, you know, I hadn't done them before. So the first 10 people to ask, probably I said, no, I'm sorry, I'll do that. But after a while, you're like, maybe I should be doing that, right? If enough people are asking it. And it so happens that one of the attorneys I'm working with has done them. 
before. And he said, yeah, let's do it. You know, if people want the wills, we can offer them for a flat rate. I think it's a great service to be able to provide also, in addition to the civil litigation and election law and everything else that we work on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sounds good. So, yeah. That's Reach actually out to much, much bigger than I, I thought. No, it is. And it was in the mailbox. It kind of like stuffed the whole mail. You can't miss it, right? Like it takes up the whole mailbox. Yeah. I was thinking a quarter page type of thing. Well, it is a quarter of the page, but it's a very big page. I mean, really, it's a half. Yeah, right? So it's more like, I guess, more like the size of a half page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But that's what's up. It's dope. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, the ironic thing here, if you, if that's the right word for it, is my ad for Wills is right next to the ad for the funeral home. That was not <laughs> by design. It was kind of grim, right? First, you hit the guy off the road <laughs> before it's too late. It's yeah. appropriate, right? Yeah. yeah. Come to come to me first, and then you know. Yeah, someone said that to me last night. They were like, you know, someone came to them about a trust, and they were asked the question, "How long do I have to get this done?" And he was like, "I was trying to find." a delicate way of putting it, like, you know, some, something were to happen to you, like, basically before you die, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but it is important, you know, and it, all jokes aside, we have heard stories of people who died intestate, they call that, right, without a will, and it becomes a nightmare oftentimes, right? What happens to their property, or maybe it goes places you don't want it to go, or it takes too long to figure out who gets it. People put in complaints, they, they try to make their claim, everyone comes out the woodwork, I should have gotten this, I should get this, Whatever it is, I mean, you want to have it all outlined in the clear legal document. So hopefully there are no questions and there's no fighting over it. I'm going through that right now. Yeah. So it is a nightmare. Yeah, absolutely. So if we make people's lives a little less stressful, one less thing to worry about, you know, most. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So, um, I actually got some interesting results on the poll that we did last week. I put it up on Reddit and we were asking about whether people were concerned right. about the way social media companies were using their private data, right? Something that you hear people talking about a lot lately. Right. And let's see. There were 174 votes on this particular poll. At first, it was kind of close, but we did get a clear winner as the dust settled on this. It was 61% yes, 39% no. So most people are concerned. Okay. Okay. Um, The response is, I'll read some of the comments as well. Go ahead. Uh Uh, So I'll read some of the comments as well, because they're kind of interesting here. But go ahead. I was going to say, it's a little bit lower than I expected. Um, 69% 69% of people are, are concerned, um, but that's a lot of people that aren't concerned. That's, uh, I don't know. Right. But I think the people who aren't concerned just don't think that there's anything useful that people, you know, that can be learned about them. They're just doing whatever, their homework or, you know, it's like they don't think that is something that they need to worry about. Yeah, that's interesting. Interesting. Yeah, like I said, I would, uh, we, you know, we did. honestly, no, go ahead. I was, I was going to say I struggled with this a little bit myself because intellectually, yes, I am concerned. And I think that's kind of the natural reaction most people are going to have. But then you start to ask, well, but what exactly are they doing that I should worry about? And what should I or what can I do to stop it? Like, like to try to make it into a problem or a mission of mine to focus on this, right? Like it seems like a little bit above my pay grade. It's almost like asking about God. Like, are you concerned? Because social media has become so ubiquitous now, right? It's like, we don't even know what the hell goes on with all this. It's just it's just there. It's just a part of the world. So I was like, yeah, it's concerning to us, but what are we really going to do about it? How much do we even know about what's happening? Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely cause to be concerned. Um, and it's being concerned can help you make uh, smarter choices when, when you're on social media, like, um, you know, platforms like Facebook, for example, have certain uh, options that you can turn on. Right. Um, 
Maybe you don't want to share certain things with advertisers. Maybe you only want your information um, shared with people that are your friends and, and not publicly. Um, you know, there are different things that you could take, the different steps you can take to limit how that data is shared and how that data is dealt with. Um, right. So being concerned and, and understanding that this might be something to think about can, can steer people in the net direction. Like, unless you're going to completely get off of social media, you can't avoid it, but you can mitigate some of. Uh, right. But I think that's why some people might be voting. No, it's like, yeah, they probably understand at a high level why someone might be concerned, but they feel like it's just so ingrained in our life now. Like, what are they going to do about it? Why, why even worry about it? You know? Yeah. But you're right. Even if you aren't single-handedly going to change the way social media companies operate, you can change your own usage behaviors. Absolutely. Right? And it was just like, um, they don't do it so much now, but um, I remember when um, the uh, what facial recognition stuff was being rolled out and, was, and Facebook and people were tagging tagging each other and whatnot. And most people were doing it not paying attention to it. Me personally, I wouldn't tag faces because I was understanding that there was a potential here for, um, you know, your, your data share and being used things. If they're right. using a facial recognition database, that could be another product that they could sell to other companies or something that they have. And so I purpose purposely would, when I tag people, I would tag like, like somewhere around here to confuse the system. So it's not building a face recognition. Like you're, you know, you tag, when I tag Scala, they're going to get like a button. Uh, I started on, doing that too because you told me that you were doing that. Although I don't know how effective that is now. I really don't know. I mean, because like, for example, my phone now will automatically sort my photos based on the person it thinks is in them. I don't know if your phone does that too, but. Um, yes, you can turn that on. Um, and for, for iPhones, it's all done on, on the device. It's not done and sent out to Apple. It's all done on the device. Um, but you also have it, you can turn that off where it doesn't do it. Yeah, no, I, I guess it was the default or whatever, because my phone will do that. Now, if I open up photos on my phone, it'll show me thumbnails of a bunch of people that are in pictures with me. And I'd be like, do you want to look, do you want to open up all pictures with that person? You know, that kind of right. thing. Yeah. And I think uh, features like that are useful if it's done on device. Right. No problem with it. If that data is then sent to Apple or Google, then I think there's something that you need to, to think about, you know, because now this this corporation that's going to be looking to make a profit has this facial recognition database of not only just your face, but if they can recognize your face, they can also recognize backgrounds. That means they can start building profiles on you. Um, you know, the, where the you question, OK, but I mean, the question also is why do you care? Why do you care? Um, privacy reasons. Um, why? Why should they know those things? Um, when I get this phone, my phone isn't for me to to give you my life. It's for me to use it how I want to use it. It's not for Apple to know where I'm at, what I'm doing, what I do in my life. It's, it's none of their business. So here is some of the, the discussion that took place on Reddit. Red Darren fourteen n says, "Big Brother can stare at my blank and blank." all day and see my messages histories. I do not care. I have nothing to hide. If I get better directed ads out of this exchange, I see it as a win. I, now, I turn that off too. <laughs> well, there's a response here from quick sector 5595 who says that's what everyone says until big brother suddenly gets pissed over a certain thing you may have liked or tweeted or whatever. Right. right? Now the original commenter, red Baron comes back and says, but the thing is, I'm not racist or bigoted, so I'm not out here spouting takes that will get me in trouble. Now, this I found to be a curious comment, and I actually had to chime in. I asked this commenter if they were located outside the U.S. They said, no, they're in the U.S. But the reason why I asked that was because I have encountered this take from people in the U.K. where they don't have free speech as a right. And if you ask them, does that concern you that you don't have a right to free speech in your country? Oftentimes, you hear them say no, because they're not saying anything racist or bigoted anyway. And so why do they need free speech rights when they're just saying things that are fine to say? You know, mm -hmm. obviously, in the U.S., we don't have that kind of view. Those aren't the type of values that we hold here for 
various right. reasons. But it is a common refrain that I hear overseas and in the UK in particular, that they're not saying anything bad, so they don't care. You know, they don't think that these things, these protections are necessary. Yeah, I, I have to disagree with that. Um, and you hear that take a lot. Yeah, I mean, you hear it, in, in, it applied to different contexts, right? Like even with, with police, well, you know, why do we care if they're, I'm not doing anything wrong. Why do we care if they're like all up in our business? Like, no, you care one privacy for one. Um, if you're doing something on social media, then yeah, it's public. Um, but why do you want a company to have a database of it attached to you where they're, they're building a profile on you, on everything about you? Um, and as far as ads go, um, on at least on the Apple like the device itself specifically, you can turn off targeting. And in some social media networks, you can also do that, turn off targeting, where they, they'll deliver ads, but they won't deliver ads to you based on whatever your profile is or whatever data they've got. Yeah. I think a lot of people have just accepted this, the world that we live in. And they're not really trying to push back against it. They're just willing to say, listen, we're on social media. <laughs> There's a price we pay for it, right? We're not paying to use Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or Reddit directly, but we're paying in other ways. We just kind of accept that. Well, that's what they say. Like if it's free, then usually the product, if a product is free, then the product you are is the product. Free. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was the, the saying also, if you don't have a menu, you're probably on it. <laughs> wow i haven't heard that one but okay yeah so, <laughs> but yeah I'm, I'm a little little surprised at the lower end of it um we we also got about 1300 views on the poll on on youtube but um there weren't, weren't any comments on it so i don't know what that's about i think someone else also said if you don't have a seat at the table you probably are the table <laughs> you too <laughs> yeah i make them that's Makes sense. Yeah. So. Well, we're interested in people's thoughts on this. So, as always, the conversation can continue. Let's see. There's another comment I got here. I'm not concerned. I'm not that interesting a person, and you won't get rich stealing from me. Um, uh, you know, you say that <laughs> until uh, something happens. You know, identity theft is a big crime, um, and. It can hurt things, it hurts you in various ways, not just monetarily, but, you know, you could deal with relationships right. and be people around you that, that get caught up in it. So well, I think we also talked about the difference between how it affects you as an individual user versus the aggregate effect on it, right? right. So sometimes that might be building up these databases or like we even when we talked about TikTok, we said, you know, maybe the main concern there with China is that they're building data on Americans, let's say, or European, whatever it is, you know, foreigners' trends and how that they're living, like what they're doing, what the kind of places they're going. Maybe they're just building intel on the people on a whole, as opposed to just Joe Schmo down the block, right? Well, I mean, think about it like this: we we saw kind of a um, an example that that could be a cautionary tale, right? Um, when we talked about several shows back about, I think it was Madison Square Garden, where they use facial recognition to determine someone from another law firm and that, that, that they didn't want to come in. So imagine you've got these social media companies have built this profile with your facial recognition data and your posts and, and this and that. So they built up a profile on who you are, what you do, what you talk about, things that you've posted, and they sell that data. So now you go somewhere and, you know, they use facial recognition and databases to say, okay, well, this person has said this, you know, we, we don't want them in here. Or we don't want to employ them or this is their views or some kind of way to discriminate against you or target you in some sort of a way. And we, and with that Madison square garden example, we've seen it's possible. Yeah. But that was just the public faces on the website of the company. And yeah, yeah, sure. It, I mean, it just seems like a lot of this information is just so public because we choose to participate in this modern world, whether it's social yeah. media or whatever else, right? We're just out yeah. in the world using the technology of the day. And yeah, it is going to put a lot of our stuff out there. Sure, absolutely. So, yeah. It's a price we pay, right? For the world that we live in, I suppose. But like you said, there are things we can do if we're concerned. To right, it. Yeah. right. And there should be, you know, um, I think there should be some ethics involved, Um that's a good so, segue, Jay. Yeah. <laughs> I said that's a good segue to the exact thing I wanted to mention. Yeah. Uh, that 
the CLE requirements in New York just changed. And it just it, it reminded me of that when you mentioned the law firm mm. a minute ago. So to renew your license as a lawyer, every few years, you have to take credits, right? There's a, a CLE called Continuing Legal Education, CLE. Now you can take these online. You know, it used to be when you first became a lawyer for your first time, I think it was like, you know, two years after you first became a lawyer, you had to go in person and take those classes. And then you could just do online classes. I think now, especially post pandemic, I think everything is just online from the jump. But um, you go and you take these online classes to renew your license. And they do have certain requirements in terms of the type of class that you take. So right now you need 25.5 total credits. And what you could do is you could study whatever interests you, right? So for example, if I'm getting more into wills, I might take credits about that, right? Maybe state planning or what have you. Right. So that's a good thing. It's a good way to keep up with developments and new areas of law that you might be trying to get into or stay current on. But they also break down certain categories. Four credits, for example, have to be in ethics. Two mm. credits have to be in elimination of bias, which is interesting. Mm. 18.5 general credits, but check this, they just added this. One credit now has to be in cybersecurity, privacy, and data protection. So that's new. When I go to take my CLE credits this year, I'm going to experience this for the first time. I really don't know what that class entails. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. I mean, it's it's not the only field that does that. Medical field has that okay. where you have to do, you know, the continuing ed credit credits and whatnot. Teachers um, do it too. Teachers do it. Insurance does. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. a lot of fields. Yeah, it's, it's and it's a good thing because um, things change uh, quite quickly, and especially in law, you would, you know, there's different things that happen all the time. So, um, right, good thing. But cybersecurity, yeah, it's interesting. But I think it, you know, we talked briefly earlier about it. Um, I think it can be a good thing especially with everything moving to the cloud and, and, and people using a lot of cloud services. Right. Um, those records need to be secure and, and people using them need to understand what the, the risks and the benefits are. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's probably what's driving it. Cause at first I was like, why does a lawyer need to take a class on cybersecurity? But I think you're right. And I do see this with my colleagues. You know, everything is kind of moving to the cloud and people are using, you know, Gmail and you use your Google Drive and everything is all online and you collaborate with people in your office online. They're moving away from paper really altogether. Everything is electronically filed now. And, and so right. with everything being online, I think there are measures that need to be taken, right? Certain things that lawyers are going to have to keep in mind to ensure the privacy of their own clients is maintained. Right. Absolutely. Um, and I wonder if that would open up, like, for example, let's say a, a lawyer was using a cloud service and there was a data breach. Would that open up that lawyer to um, being sued by their clients if their, you know, private information well, was leaked through that? It, it, it will come down to a negligence standard. Right. So in a situation like that, the question is always, did that lawyer or whoever it is, did that person take the reasonable steps that a prudent person would in order to prevent that from happening, right? So just because something like that happens doesn't mean that the person is automatically liable, but you have to see if they met their standard of care, like if they took the right. steps that a prudent person would take. Um, if they were doing things that, for example, all other lawyers were taught to do, but they didn't do, they failed to do it, that could be a cause of action. Yeah. And a class like this could help them evaluate services that, that they just decide they want to use like cloud services, for example, or any internet services to see if it meets that criteria that like, you know, this is something that gives reasonable protection. Right. Or even things like making sure things are password protected and that it opens to the public. Like, you know, you, sometimes you have, I don't know, Google calendar or a certain, even like a document. So, you know, you have to make sure, check the settings on all your documents to make sure that, that only the person with a link can view it or it's read only or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Some people might not know that, right. They might yeah. just audit and it's open to the public and anyone can get their stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, no, it's good. Um, I think, uh, you know, maybe people in Congress need uh, continuing ed credits. Yeah, right. Or I just see. ed credits. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> I haven't learned something. Like, look, 
you need to keep up with it. This is you need to take a class on on cybersecurity and uh, AI and whatnot before you sit on a committee and talk about it. Yeah, so, right. Some kind of primer. Yeah, something. And then every year you need you need to keep going back. Like you know, it's not it's not a big ask for what for what you're tasked to do. So. Yeah, I remember there was a bill that we were pushing at one point um, called the Write the Bills Act, which would mm. require a member of Congress who was going to introduce a bill or a member uh, of the right. staff to actually write the bill they were introducing and not just push something through that was given to them by a lobbyist or somebody else. Right, right. And, and to me, it makes, you know, it should be that way. Yeah, it makes sense. But, you know, having now worked in the legislature myself, it's a little tricky when you start thinking about how something like that would be implemented, because what if someone approached you with an idea? I mean, where would you draw the line? Like, okay, you can give me an idea, but I have to write it. Now, what if they present language to you? Do you have to say, well, I like that language, but I have to change it because I have to write it myself. And then what do you change? Did you, did you change a few words around? Do you have to, I mean, could you not then introduce a bill that someone else wrote, even if it's a good bill? I mean, so you do have some challenges there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. It's just, I don't know. It, it, the idea of uh, a lobbying group just presenting a bill and then the, the the Congress member just passing it along just doesn't sit very well. It's like, you know, right. you should have some responsibility for what's on this bill um, and right. have a hand in, in, in it. So Yeah, I mean, man, maybe it should just be, okay, you can present your ideas, but when it comes to actually drafting the language, just leave that to us, right? Right, yeah. So, so I, and that's a good segue. I wanted to talk about this Far Rockaway now being included in the city ticket program, right? The Long Island Railroad discounted fare during off peak hours. It used to be just for the weekends, but now it's for off peak hours in general. Far Rockaway was the only station in the system, in the New York City system of the Long Island Railroad, that was not eligible for this weekend and now this off-peak discounted program. Now, I say that with a caveat because I did work on this. I want to talk about this a little bit. When I was in Albany, one of the first bills that appeared on my desk when I first got there was actually a version, a very early version of this, where they were trying to include Far Rockaway in the program, right? But technically, it wasn't just Far Rockaway. It was Far Rockaway and Belmont Station. Belmont Station was in Queens, technically, but the events that people would go to when they took the train to Belmont were primarily in Nassau. And so they didn't really think of it as a New York City destination, right? Far Rockaway is a different story. Far Rockaway obviously is in New York City, although I say obviously sometimes Rockaways don't get treated like they are. But the issue with that allegedly was that the Far Rockaway branch of the Long Island Railroad um, went through Nassau County. So I'm right. sure you're familiar, Jay, having lived in Dolly Stream. If you were to take the train to Far Rockaway, you would actually go through Nassau, through the five towns, and then go back into Far Rockaway. So you would be in New York City, hypothetically, and then you would take the train through Nassau County and end up in New York City again. And yeah. so they use this as an excuse because they said, well, these discounted tickets were for trips that started and ended in New York City. Of course, we said, yeah, they are starting and ending in New York City. But the fact that it, it went through Nassau County was a, a reason in their minds to mm. exclude Far Rockaway because they said, well, people will take advantage of this. It's only meant for people in, in, in New York City or, you know, and then it was all kinds of, of silliness going on because they, they would say, well, you know, the conversation would be maybe people should show ID and prove that they really live. I'm like, it doesn't matter where you live. If you take, if you buy a train ticket anywhere, you're supposed to get the fares based on where you're buying the ticket and where you're going, not where you live. Who the hell cares where someone lives, you know? And so there was a, a discriminatory aspect to it as well, you know, that didn't sit right with me. And Rockway always, let's be honest, gets the short end of the stick, right? So this was like another slap in the face. Mm. Um, and so I actually did write a series of articles in the Rockaway Times several years back now talking about my experience with this particular legislation. In fact, I, I think we um, called it the FAIR Act, and it was a play on the word FAIR, right? F-A-R-E or F-A-I-R. And, and that was just it. It was an act to get Far Rockway included in the discount program. Now, believe it or not, got some pushback from the senator at the time 
who represented Belmont, or, you know, the Elmont area where Belmont is, is located. And he didn't like that. That first version that came across my desk that I ended up uh, introducing that year again was basically saying all stations are included except Belmont. And he thought that politically that would make him look bad. He was running for Congress at the time. And he had his own political implications to be concerned about. But it wasn't that we were trying to exclude Belmont. Belmont was already excluded, right? We were just saying Far Rockway should be included. So, you know, these things might strike you as petty. It struck me as petty at the time. Now I've got a little bit more experience. I kind of understand the aspects of it a little, a little bit more. We basically had to rewrite the bill and, and the end result would have been exactly the same, right? It would have achieved the same exact thing as always, but the language of it had to change so that we weren't explicitly keeping Belmont out. We were just saying, put Far Rockway in and saying nothing right. about Belmont anymore, right? Which is, right. to me, that was like so silly. I'm like, come on, wh- why are you bickering over this? But now I kind of understand it from a political perspective, you know? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm definitely familiar with that line. I've, uh, <laughs> I've fallen asleep and woken up at Far Rockway more. Uh, before. You know what's funny? It's funny that you say that. And and I do have to shout out Senator Sanders and, and Assemblywoman Stacey Fafermato. So, Collaboratively, they were able to get it into the budget this year. And finally, after all these years of trying to push it through, this year it's happening. So Far Rockwood will enjoy the discount. But when Senator Sanders gave his press conference on it, he mentioned that there was an, I think it was McDonald's that used to have an ad on the subway system that said something like, uh, don't fall asleep on a train or you might wake up in Far Rockwood. Yeah, that happened to me once. Um, that happened to me once. Um, but I think there it is a good point that um you know it could be taken advantage of right so if you just if you buy a uh say i'm going to um valley stream and i decide that i'm i'm gonna buy the ticket for far rockaway like i would get i would be getting a discount right. and then you just get off at valley stream right and to be honest i probably would have done that because sure people it's quite will. expensive it's quite expensive going to um, you know, Valley Stream from from Manhattan or wherever, because the long LIR prices are much higher. Right. But does that justify excluding people in Far Rockaway from being able to use this program? Um, I don't think it should. Um, but I can understand the concern, because uh, exactly. at that point, then you're basically saying that because everyone's going to do it then, right? Everyone's going to buy tickets to Far Rockaway that is going on that line. And so basically you're saying that the fare for everywhere else has just been reduced. But you're assuming that everyone is going to cheat the system. I'm sure that's going to happen, but it always happens. Yeah, anyway. they will. With prices as high as they are, absolutely they would. But yeah, here's something else to think about. Why is it? I, mean, I kind of know why it is, but for argument's sake, there are other stations that are on the border with Nassau that still got to enjoy the discount, like Burlesdale and Valley Stream. Um, you can go up north, right, with Great Neck and Little Neck, things like that. Oh, so Rosedale still got it. Yeah. It didn't apply to Far Rock. Even though it's, on, even though it's on the same line. Right. So, yeah, that doesn't make sense. Well, I guess it, it doesn't make sense because people could still do this. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how they would... Yeah, I guess they could still do that, though. Well, the, the the difference would be they would be over. They would be overstaying the ride at that point. Like, say, say for example, I wanted the discount. and I was going to Valley Stream uh-huh. uh, and I bought the ticket to Rosedale and I get the discount and then I stay on until Valley Stream. Now I've overstayed. My right. ride, which is and going so to and they, don't always, they don't always check like they're supposed to. But if you overstay the ride, I mean, the conductor is supposed to be able to say, hey, you have to pay more now. So yeah, versus if I were to, if it was the other way, and I got the discount at uh, going, bought the ticket going to Far Rockaway, and then I jumped off at Valley Stream, I haven't overstayed. I'm still on the ride. Right. What they would say also is that the train to Far Rockaway necessitates going through Nassau. So they thought that was like you know more of a reason to be concerned because you're always going to be dra- traveling through Nassau right. to get to Far Rockaway. That's not the, the case going to Rosedale or other stations. But and right and at the same time, I, I do get like you know Far Rockaway shouldn't be penalized because that's how the train was built. Like it was, it's routes through. It's in Queens, but it routes through 
Long Island, and they shouldn't be penalized for that one. Right. If you're going to have a program that says that you get discounted fares off peak from and to destinations within New York City, it really isn't right to say except Far Rockaway. <laughs> right. I think Especially that, and, because Far Rockaway and, and the Rockaways in general are so starved for good transportation in the first place. Right. It's so cut off from the rest of the city. And this is just making it worse. Yeah, I can also see, though, at the same time, there are other options to get to Far Rockaway, whereas with Rosedale, there aren't any other options or Valley Stream. Like there's an LIR and that's it. OK, so you're saying because of the subway. Right. You don't have subway access to the places. You can hop on those and go. Whereas. Right. But as far as hold on a second, though, as far as New York City is concerned, Far Rockaway and the Rockaways have less access than most places. Sure. But if you're if you're going to go with that. Um, Rosedale has less access as far as New York City goes than Far Rockaway. It's got only one train. Yeah, but it's also not disconnected as much. So it doesn't take as long to get places, right? I mean, there's, there's plenty of bus access. It's Rockaways have buses, but you're so disconnected that it's, it's a long trip no matter where you're going, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't I, I, I agree that it's not fair since they are in, in New York City. Um, but so so what's what's the, the outcome? Are they going to. Yeah, no, it's, included. So it's, in the state, it's now it's going to be part of the state budget that this is funded. And that's actually another funny thing. I, you know, I don't want to go too much into the details of what happened behind the scenes, but it was very eye opening to me, because, like I said, when I first got to Albany, that really was just about the first bill that I saw that I was working with. And like I said, I ended up having to rewrite it and, and play with it. But um, we got it through the transportation committee way back in 2016. And at the time that was considered a big win because people thought that it wouldn't have any traction whatsoever. They're like, Oh, you know, the, the MTA ain't, ain't, ain't doing this. We ain't doing this. And Republicans controlled the state Senate at the time. And they didn't necessarily understand the issues. I remember the chair of the transportation committee, I think he was based in Rochester at the time. Mm-hmm. And so didn't really understand what was going on with New York City Transit and you know the MTA and Long Island Railroad. Well, he should because he was the chair of transportation. And so I'm sure he had some kind of familiarity with digits in that role. But being from Rochester, r- really not. And, and more than that, his staffer, right? Because the staffer is really who run the show a, a lot of the times. So his staffer, who was in charge of putting the committee agendas together, he didn't really know either. I mean, he, he said he kind of knew a little bit. I think he said he might have spent some time in Long Island or something like that. But, he, you know, he didn't really know like a New York City person would know. And we, in fact, we even had a letter writing campaign and a, a call campaign, which, <laughs> which apparently uh, offended or intimidated some of the, the more delicate, I guess, upstate um, staffers because they were not used to a bunch of angry, transit-starved Rockaway people calling them saying, we want this damn discount. Mm-hmm. I, I actually got... we got some pushback that that was uh, uh, intimidating to them. Right. But we did all we could to get it passed. And I had my intern at the time, uh, shout out to Michael Gregory, who took um, a, a map of the Long Island Railroad system and blew it up. And we were able to take it to this office, this transportation chair's office and sit with the staffer and say, listen, this is what we're dealing with here. Look at how other stations on the border of Queens and New York and Long Island also um, are in similar predicament, not quite the same, but similar. And they get the discount. Rockaway, you can see, is so isolated from the rest of the city and it is singled out as not getting it. That's just not fair to the people who live there. So we kind of just showed, showed them what was going on. And believe it or not, they sympathized with it, right? And they said, you know, you know what, you're, you're right. This, what you're saying makes sense. And, the, and Republicans didn't have to do this because we were Democrats trying to push our bills through. They were able to pick and choose which ones they gave us. They didn't have to give us any. They would usually throw Democrats some bones here and there just to say that they did show that they're bipartisan. They reached across the aisle or maybe it looks good. Maybe, maybe when they figure when they're in a the minority party, they'll get some bones thrown at them. But, you know, most of the bills that they were putting on those agendas were their own. Right. They weren't, weren't putting a whole lot of Democratic bills on. We were able through persuasion and persistence and I guess pestering them, <laughs> eventually able to get the bill on the transportation committee agenda and it passed. And again, this is a Republican controlled committee. We got it through. But here's something else I remember from that experience. We were celebrating well, high fives all around when we got it on the agenda for transportation. We show up the morning of the vote, right? 
and a call comes in. It was like something you would see like in a movie. It's like so mysterious. But the phone rings in the committee conference room, right? The staffer comes, he picks it up. He's talking. And he's like, okay, I see. All right. And he hangs up and he walks into the other room. And I knew exactly what that was. Like, I just knew it when that happened. They were flagging my bill for finance, meaning, sure, we'll pass it through this transportation committee, but don't think it's going to get passed by the whole Senate because next we're going to put it in a finance committee where it's going to sit and, and die this year, right? Next year, maybe you'll fight to get it through finance. But so it's like, we'll give you like a little small win this year so you can tell everyone, hey, we got it through transportation. Next year, you got to fight for it all over again with this finance committee. And I was even trying to make the argument, you know, listen, the finance committee is supposed to be a committee where bills go that get voted on when they have a significant financial impact to the state, right? I was saying this isn't the state's money we're playing with. The MTA is not the state. Yes, there's a lot of state control there, but you know, people like saying the MTA is, st- is a state body. Technically, it's not. The city appoints people to. It's more state control than the city controlled. Yes, right? More control by the governor than the mayor. Absolutely. But it isn't a creature of the state. It's technically its own entity. So I was saying, why is this flagged for the finance committee? But, you know, they were able to justify it by saying this is going to affect the bottom line of the state since this, since the state and the MTA are so intrinsically tied that that just gave them enough of a rationale to say, now it's got to get through finance, right? Mm-hmm. And that's what we would often hear. Finance is where bills go to die, right? Because um, they don't have to flag it for finance, but they did. So in that spirit, it was negotiated as part of the state budget this year, right? And again, does it have to go to the state budget? This is the MTA. I argue not necessarily, but, you know, that's how they did it, right? They looked at it as having financial implications for the state. And so it had to go through the budget. And of course, when something gets passed through the budget, well, that covers the financial aspect of it, right? That's what the budget is for. So you don't have to worry about that component of it anymore. And so... Um, we're getting it. That's the you know the bottom line is it took years of fighting for it, and I think uh, when I was up in Albany, I was able to help get that ball rolling. But you know, here we are, and again, I have to commend Senator Sanders and the Assemblywoman Stacey Fefferamato for being able to get it across the finish line. So, have, has there been anything said to address the potential for abuse uh, of the the fair that you know is going to happen, or they just be like, you know what, it is what it is. Um, let's make sure that Rockaway gets the the discount. Yeah, from what I'm seeing, they're saying, look, you know, people might abuse the system, but abuse always happens. We don't want abuse to happen. And we're fine with checks that you might want to put in place if, if there are any that could mitigate this. But the bottom line here is that we don't find this to be a persuasive reason to deprive Rockaway of the discount. Right. So right. Let's start there. Let's say, no, Rockaway gets it because if, if Rockaway is part of New York City, Rockaway should enjoy all the benefits that New York City gets. Now, yeah. are there issues with it being physically isolated and geographically situated the way it is. Sure. Now let's deal with these issues as opposed to going backwards, which is Rockaway can't even get the discount because of our issues. I mean, that just wasn't right. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. So. Sounds super awesome though. Like we said, progress, right? Yeah. Progress. You got to take a few steps and work out the rest of the stuff works out later. Yeah. Yeah. And I really could, I think I put that in my Facebook post. I could write a memoir based on my experiences with this bill in particular, right? <laughs> because so much went on and I don't even want to talk about all the behind the scenes stuff, but you're talking about cocktail parties. I mean, you could even make a show about it, right? Like all the stuff that you, you hear about going on in Albany and in, in the Capitol, wherever it is, any state or even the US Capitol, you know, trying to convince these senators, again, this was a Republican majority at the time. So it's really all in their hands. We had to kind of like schmooze with them and try to convince them why this was a good idea and why it would be a good look for them or why it wouldn't cost them that congressional race they were worried about or, why, you know, why this would be good for your people too. And you try to like a, appeal to them for you know, whatever is going to get them interested in it. Uh, in the chat, we've got a question. Where does the Rockaway line end on the LIRR? Uh, far Rockaway. Yeah. Rockaway's by Mott Avenue. And we can pull up a uh, map and do a share screen to show people. Yeah, so. Yeah, right there at the end of there. <laughs> yeah, no, and honestly, I don't like how Far Rockaway is used and the Rockaways in general are used as the butt of a joke, right? I mean, like you said, you fell asleep and you ended up in Far Rockaway, but McDonald's was saying, like, you better not fall asleep because you don't want to end up in Far Rockaway. And it was kind of like, a derisive thing to say, I think, about the Rockaways. 
Yeah. And it wasn't the only one. There were other ad campaigns that said something similar. Yeah. Just that with, with the way that LIR, tra- LIR trains run like every half hour instead of like every few minutes, like a subway, you know, you're going to have to I wait did. a while for the next one. So, but I had, I have taken it a few times purposefully, but uh, I, mean, I remember falling asleep once. Right. I mean, and, and that holds true for any line. I mean, you know, you don't want to fall asleep and end up at the last station of any line and have to come back. Right. But single out far Aquay, it makes it seem like that's a place no one would want to go on their own, you know? Right, right. Absolutely. So. Should I do a share screen here? Let's see. There's the map. I don't know if that helps people visualize it, but that red marker on there that says far Aquay. I um, can't tell which one is the train line. Um, it's, the, it's the red marker over here. You see it? Yeah. Let me get on now. It says Far Rockaway. There it is. Yep. That's there the one. Is. Yeah. That's the, that's the one. So. Uh, but it's great. Um, yeah. Uh, that's it. In the chat, Lixa says, I wouldn't want to fall asleep and end up in the Rockways and then wait to go back just to inconvenience the time. Yeah, that's that's what I was mentioning, like, because, yeah. you know, the LIRR only runs like every half hour or maybe longer. So you definitely have to um, wait a little bit longer than you would for any other for a subway train for the next subway train. So right. Depending on the time of night, it could be an hour between trains. So. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then depending on where you're going, sometimes you got to take the shuttle. I remember uh, when Fury was on here, he was talking about his experience without living in the Rockaways, right? How right. they get the shuttle at Broad Channel and, you know, change trains. And people got confused with the a- different A lines, right? I would right. see that all the time also by the airport over here in Howard Beach. You would have tourists coming off the train. And they're like, am I on the right A or why is it taking so long? And, you know, we talked about that. They just start looking at the map asking people questions like i was told to take the a train how come i'm not where i'm i'm trying to go to get to you know All right but the good news the discount is there so that's awesome that, that should help a lot of people out because that's you know it's a significant amount of money to go to jump on the lir so it's yeah this should barely right let's just equitable treatment yeah like mayor adam said let's go let's go back to that i, I actually like like what he said <laughs> look, look at me feeling myself over the certificate, right? That's all good, man. <laughs> you are helping us achieve our goal of building a fairer, more equitable, and inclusive future for all. What and that's said. what it should be about. That's what we should be trying to do. Absolutely. So, with that in mind, yeah, right? We wanted to talk about this incident on the subway. I guess that's yeah. one of the subway. There it is, right? Speaking of abuse, I guess. Another kind of yeah. abuse on the subway, uh, this choking death. Um, I know I put Bernie Getz in the headline here. And I know you mentioned you weren't familiar, or you maybe you forgot the name, but that mm-hmm. was a very controversial figure in the 80s. And in fact, in criminal law, in law school, we read about it as well. But I mean, it's, it became kind of a part, part of pop culture at the time. If you ever heard the Billy Joel song, We Didn't Start the Fire, he mentions Bernie Getz by name in his song. But that was a vigilante so to speak, who shot people on the subway. But he effectively was there looking to cause trouble, right? Because don't forget, at that time, there was a concern, much like there is now, about increased crime. And a lot of people were afraid of riding the subways and people were getting robbed and attacked and, and so forth. And he went there with the gun on the subway, basically saying, you know, I hope someone starts it with me. They're going to get theirs, right? And he eventually found his trouble. Some guys were messing with him. I think they were trying to rob him or what have you. And he ended up shooting them all. In fact, even one guy was trying to run away and he shot him. And it became a, became a very, very big controversial thing with some people in the city saying he was a hero, believe it or not, because I think they were afraid of being attacked on the subway. Maybe they were attacked on the subway themselves and they saw him as someone who was standing up for them. A lot of other people were saying, you know, no one wants to see people get robbed, but that doesn't justify carrying a gun, basically looking for that trouble and, and shooting people, you know, escalating the situation to something where it doesn't have to be. Mm. So, 
Yeah. Kind of a similar situation here, I guess, because I'm seeing his name invoked a lot now uh, following this incident that just happened with uh, Jordan Neely, right? Who was a 30 year old uh, performer. I think he was a Michael Jackson impersonator. And he was choked to death by a former U.S. Marine. Right. Um, right. Um, very tragic situation all around here. And from what people have said, right, from the reports I've said, I guess Jordan Neely was in a very bad place in his life. And maybe he made some threats. I don't know. Maybe there were vague threats. I don't know how specific they got. I don't think he was straight up saying he was going to kill people, but I think he kind of made reference to like, I don't care if I go to prison for life, something like that. Right. And I understand that being very menacing in a general way towards the people on that train. And so this individual who was a U.S. Marine ended up choking him to death, but he had him in a chokehold for, what was it, 15 minutes? 15 minutes. He, he held him in a chokehold for 15 minutes and, yeah, choked him to death. I don't... I don't... And so it just it doesn't really make sense to me why this would happen. Because, I mean, you know, unless you're just trying to kill the guy, which that seems like a conclusion one might draw from this, because he's saying that he wasn't trying to harm him and he didn't know he was just trying to hold him down till authorities arrive. but he's a Marine. He's trained. You would know. Yeah. He, he, he should know the strength of whatever chokehold he was using. Um, and then you don't have to hold it that tight. If you're trying to subdue it as right. a Marine, he would know different ways to subdue someone or, or, and to keep them under control while someone's coming. So I don't, I don't buy buy whatever his excuse. I didn't know or whatnot. Of course, it has to go to court and and all of that sort yeah. of thing. But yeah, it shouldn't have happened. Now, um, you know, you should definitely are allowed to should be able to defend yourself. Um, and even if that means the other person gets hurt, so be it. But not to the point where you're killing someone, right? Unless there's imminent harm to yourself in that regard, and it just wasn't. You know. Um. There needs to be not just a subjective, but an objective component to that as well. So if you're going to say it was self-defense or the defense of others, right? It isn't just you personally felt scared. It's how would a reasonable person in your shoes feel? And again, you have to take the fact that he was a Marine into account here. Um, right. You're comparing him against other Marines who have the similar type of training and background as him. And we learned about this in law school as well. You know, if you're a boxer, and you punch someone in the face, you have to be held to account in, in, in terms of, you know, knowing that your fists are potentially lethal weapons. It's not the same as someone with no boxing training or no combat training punching you in the face. There's a different legal standard there. Same thing if you're a NASCAR driver on a the road, they say you should be able to navigate that car better. And when it comes to the traffic laws, like you should have better control of your car than the average person would, because this is what you were trained in. This is what you do. Similar would apply for a Marine. I mean, a Marine applying a chokehold, especially if you learn that technique in the Marines. I mean, I think that there should be more accountability, more liability, a higher standard on someone like that than your average person who who would do something like that. I mean, if it was someone who never applied a technique like that before, still probably not justifiable, but there's more believability there in terms of they didn't know, or, you know, maybe they wouldn't have known. They got scared in the moment, whatever, right? That's a little bit more believable than someone who was actually trained for a combat type situation. Right. And, and I mean, there's more details I'd like, definitely like to hear because, you know, even a casual, for example, a casual watcher of uh, martial arts or MMA or anything like that is familiar with um, the rear naked choke, right? And even if you're not even familiar with it, it's been tested on different shows and whatnot. You can put someone unconscious within, you know, within seconds with proper rear naked choke where it's compressing on the neck. And I believe it's the carotid artery. It and, shuts off the carotid uh, artery, so you take your blood to your brain, right? And then people will pass out within a few can pass out within a few seconds um, if they're not actively defending against it. Right. So at some point within that first m- minute, that guy's body would have went limp, and so that means you kept that compression for the next fifteen minutes, which would be depriving that the brain of oxygen. It just doesn't uh, make any it, sense to me. And how can you turn around and say you didn't know or you, that you're going to plead ignorance? 15 right. minutes of that? That doesn't right. make any kind of, I don't, I, I don't understand it. I'm struggling no. to understand how this is even being used as an excuse or 
yeah. what he's even really saying here. Listen, there's, you know, like I said, the body would go limp. You would know the guy was out. And, you know, then you would, you should be loosening your, your grip at that point. I'm not saying completely let it go, but you can, you can loosen it so that blood flows. Um, now, I see this relates to negligence. I, you know, you asked me before about if a lawyer could be held accountable for a data breach. I mean, you might take a similar approach here if you were going to charge him. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying what the charges are necessarily going to be, but let's say you're going to charge him with involuntary manslaughter, right? Which is negligently causing the death of another person. That would be part of the analysis. Would someone else have done the same thing in his position? Right. Um, and again, not just subjectively, but objectively. So, it's, you know, it's not just uh, a scared, you know, whatever, whatever he says he is, whatever his mind state was, it's not someone of that. It's, it's, would a reasonable person with his similar type background and training have handled the situation the same way? Right. Um, now, uh, city council uh, speaker, Adrian Adams, she pointed that there's a, a racism component to this. And I believe that would also match with the, the, the Bernie gets because the four people that he shot at were um, African-American. And this, right. this one guy in this, in this instance was also African-American and there's, now, I know a lot of people are like, well, don't bring race into everything. However, there is a, a very well-documented, proven, uh, implicit bias when it comes to um, aggression or retaliation or whatever it is against Black people. They're seen as stronger. They're seen as more vicious. Um, and it's just a bias that is inherent in a lot of people in the country unconsciously because it's what society is. And so there could be that, that he just felt that this guy was even more of a threat because of that. Right. I don't know anything about this guy's political views or his racial views after that, but, you know, that that could be a potential issue as well. I realize that from a legal perspective, that perversely bolsters his defense in a sense. Like it's really, really a crazy thing to even think about. But, you know, basically you're saying that societally there's this heightened fear of African-Americans. And so if he's trying to say, you know, listen, I wasn't negligent because other people would also be afraid of him because he was black. I mean, that's a crazy thing to argue, but I mean, it, it does tend to help. I, I, I suppose that defense, right. That he's, he didn't just act his that way himself. Other people would have done the same thing. That would be very unfortunate. Um, yeah. You know, and we've, uh, I just, what was it? I just posted recently. There was a study that they did with um, with teachers, and um, they used computers to track uh, eye movements. And they were having teachers in elementary school situations, and these were uh, very very young children. And they they showed that the implicit bias there was real, also where these teachers would, uh, especially white teachers, were paying more attention, keeping more of an eye on black children than they would right. anyone else. Right. Um, and so it, it permeates the culture. Now, in this case, don't know what, you know, what it is. Like I said, uh, Adrian Adams brought up the racism component. Um, and well, it's did all she say, what, what was her quote? I mean, did, is she saying that this is, uh, she said, racism, is she saying there's a racial component because of, of the identities of the parties. Uh, she said, um, where is it? Said, Neely was a New Yorker, a son and a performer, and he should still be alive. Uh, racism content that continues what, to permeate throughout our society allows for a level of dehumanization that denies Black people from being recognized as victims when subjected to acts of violence. Well, that's something that you're seeing also, not just in the incident, as tragic as it was, but in people's reactions to it. And I'm seeing how people are talking that, about this. Yes. And you do see that. I mean, and people aren't usually saying it's because he was black, but there is that kind of undercurrent there where you're thinking it, people seem to be talking about the victim here, uh, Jordan Neely, um, right. as if he wasn't human. Like it's, right. it's almost like they're, they're humanizing the aggressor more than the victim. Right. And, and, and we see that in, in more often uh, in uh, when the 
person is black than if there is someone else. Right. Um, again, it's part of the implicit bias that's just inherent in the in the country. Um, what was the other? There was another. I can't think of it off the top of my head right now. I just lost it. It was there and it went. <laughs> but, yeah. And of course, yeah. I'm not saying that uh, the fact that racism <laughs> exists and it is so prevalent in our society serves as a total defense for this guy. I'm not saying that. And of course, you still right. also have you know, hate crime laws and discrimination laws and things Absolutely. like that as well to take into account. But I'm just saying there is some kind of uh, perversion, right, in this concept that if, if the legal standard is how would a typical person of your background behave in your shoes, you know, if we're going to acknowledge that uh, people are more likely to be afraid when someone is black, then that kind of plays into that card a little bit, right, in, in terms of the typical person you- might have also been scared. They could attempt to use that as a, as a sort of defense, kind of like, uh, remember a few years back, there was, um, uh, what did they use that? Um, the rich kid was on, on trial for something and um, he got off because it was like, he was, since he was born so privileged, he was ignorant of this situation. Right. Um, what did they call that? I forgot what it was. Some, maybe someone in the chat knows what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, he, he got he got off on something that the rest of us would have been would have been arrested for or would have been charged for or found guilty of. But oh, yeah. He got, yeah, he was let's be honest. I think that that happens all the time, even if it's not explicitly said or articulated that way. You right. know, when you shoot cops, for example, and, and they shoot an unarmed black person. And when they do get acquitted of it. Right. Their defense is usually, well, I was scared. And I think maybe sometimes that's unspoken, but I think there is an element of that in there that they're trying to persuade the court, the jury, that they, of course, they were scared because black people are scary, right? I think that's that's kind of in there. Right. A- there it was affluenza. They, they called it affluenza. It was uh, okay. The, they the complaint on influenza. Right, right. So that was his. Um, that was his defense was, was that because he was, what was it? Uh, I can't pull it up right now, but he didn't, the claim was that he didn't understand the consequences because he was raised rich. He killed like four people, I think in a drunk driving incident or something like that. And he got off completely free because they said, yeah, he wouldn't have understood. Like it didn't make any sense. Um, but even if we drill down this this case here, um, the guy still should have released that chokehold. Oh yeah, after, absolutely. After the body went limp, no matter who it is, no matter what the th- if the body's limp, the guy's out. So, yep, Lixa found it. Okay. Yeah, no, it's just you know, I don't even comprehend. Yeah, so there's something more going on there, whether it's racism, whether it's just simple negligence, whether it's, I mean, he was a veteran, so I don't know if he was a combat veteran, maybe it was PTSD. I don't know what it's what's going on, but he should have released that show code. So. It's, yeah, it's, and you know, and none of us were at that scene, so it, it's hard for us to say. And this is why, as a lawyer, I tend not to comment on cases because I don't have all the evidence and I, you know, I don't want to say, I think a lot of people like to play armchair lawyer, like, Oh, this person is definitely guilty of whatever. Or it's like, you know, you know, I'm not in the courtroom. And I know that as we talked about, it's not all, only about whether they did something or not also, right. It's about whether the uh, protocols were followed, whether the rules are followed, whether the prosecution met its burden of proof uh, whether it did so lawfully. Um, there's, there's a lot that goes into it. And so I, I tend not to get involved. And, and you know, I, I want to be fair and say we weren't in that train. And so we don't know what really provoked the situation. I mean, how bad was it? Right. I mean, um, people might have taken videos as far as I've seen. The videos really started when, once the chokehold was already applied. Um, I don't know if there's video out there that showed the escalation of the situation to even see whether it seemed like someone should have jumped on this guy and held him down in the first place. I mean, who really started the altercation physically? Right. There's that question. And then um, again, my, my biggest ask is what if, what was he thinking when the guy's body went limp? Yeah. On the 
that that's to oh, me yeah, like, no, definitely definitely and that that's a critical piece of it but i'm just you know I think that, going yeah. a step further i'm thinking why did he think he had to put this guy in a chokehold in the first place right uh, i know you know from what i've seen he was being kind of menacing but how direct were his threats i mean was he killed because people were afraid of crime on the subway or were they truly af- afraid and justifiably so of this particular man right uh in the chat uh, said he shouldn't have led with a chokehold. There are so many other moves. I wrestled in high school, and his training was so much greater. Yeah, as a Marine, he would have had, like you mentioned, Mike, um, the, the training that he would have had would have, um, been, he would have other, many other options. Um, and he should have known, again, I go keep going back to when the body went limp, because that's, yeah. you know, once someone's I, out, kills, I mean, as far as I know, it doesn't take 15 minutes to kill someone. You can kill them in much shorter time, right? Yeah. With a chokehold like that. Um, yeah, I mean, he per- but when they go unconscious, it's because there's not enough oxygen to the right. brain. If you keep going, then you're going that's, to... Yeah, but that's the sign. Once they're unconscious, you, yeah, you, you got yeah, to let them go. go. Yeah. yeah. So... And there's no way someone, again, especially with his kind of training, wouldn't have known Right. right. He, that the guy was unconscious. Right. Right. So very unfortunate uh, case and hopefully um, justice is served. Um, yeah, um, yeah. Hopefully we see more of that progress. I mean, that's, you know, a major setback, although I guess incidents happen all the time. I mean, some are just more high profile than others and some are more tragic than others. But uh, this was an example of, of one of those. One, I think one of these things that makes us think that we haven't made as much progress as we had hoped for. Right. Right. So. Um, and I think it's going to make people still more afraid to get on the subway. Yeah. I think that's another component of it. That seems like, you know, a lot of instances keep popping up on the subway. Um, so. Yeah. yeah, that needs to be addressed. But For those saying that this was a hero, I really want to hear more about why you believe that? What is it that I'm missing? Uh, I think I think I can see a couple of different reasons how someone might say hero. One, if if uh, the racism part can play in there, they see uh, you know black guy acting out, whatever. Yeah, put him down. Oh, yeah, I, I can see that angle. Um, also, I can see from people who are saying, you know. If there are people that are, are like you said, menacing or, or causing issues or, or, or messing with people on the subway, this guy stopped it. I can see the hero angle from from that point of view, even if it wasn't a, a racism component. It's like, you know, this guy's threatening people on, on the subway. Someone put a stop to it. Everyone's safer. So I understand that angle as well. Um, I think people looking at it and seeing, OK, wow, this guy killed this guy. That should stop the talk right there. That's what I was going to say. I mean, shouldn't the response be proportionate? Right. If if he if he just put him down in the chokehold or, or put him down and subdued him to the cops came, yeah, okay, you know, dude, you you you're a hero. You helped everyone there or whatever. But you kept right. going. Or or if the guy had a gun, let's say, and was about yeah. to shoot someone, and someone choked him and he happened to die, still a tragic situation. But then at least you can say the response was more proportionate to what the person was doing in the first place. But to right. escalate it to ultimate death, right? right? I mean, was the incident even at that level to start with? Right. That that shows that that shows a, a, a callousness uh, and again a de- dehumanizing of of people in general, much less uh, whether it's black or not. That just shows a you know a dehumanization of. Uh, and we see it often, dehumanization of criminals, right? Or or of people that are sus- suspected to be criminals. Well, that's um, something else I think that you, you just hit on. I think some people are trying to bring up the fact that this guy did not have such a, a clean history, right? So they don't right. want to look at him as deserving, I guess, of being treated fairly or even surviving, right? I, I think that's kind of what we're seeing here. Like, if and, someone... Is, and is a big able to be, if, they're, if they're able to be classified as criminal in whatever way, even if it's something relatively minor in the grand right. scheme of things, it's easy for people to write them off as not deserving life or being treated with respect like everyone else is. Right. And 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 that shouldn't matter when it comes to you know the law and, and, and 
what was happening at that time. Like whatever he did in his past or whatever, that didn't have any bearing on whatever that situation was at that given time. And the guy that choked him out didn't know anything about this guy's past. So that was all whatever happened, happened within that, that incident. Right. Um, what crime was he, uh, Jeremy in the chat, what crime was he committing at the moment? Um, from what I understand, it's just that he was, uh, you know, being a little, he was being menacing on the train, you know? Yeah, I think, yeah, like I said, I, I would want more and hopefully someone has cell phone footage. I don't know. Or this, I don't know if it's going to be surveillance footage to actually see what was going on and even what was said. Right. Because I saw stories that, you know, he basically came on and I think he was asking for money or um, right. suggesting that people should give him money. And he was doing so in a, in a aggressive, right. Very aggressive way. Now, how aggressive and you know, did it cross the line into certain crimes? Like I couldn't tell you just based on the vague descriptions that I've seen, but um, I did see something like uh, he said something to the effect of it. He doesn't care if he goes to prison for life. So when you say something right. like that, like you're kind of insinuating that you might kill someone because there aren't many uh, crimes that put you in jail for life, but you're not directly saying it either. I don't think he said, give me your money or I'm going to kill you. I mean, and also clearly to seem like a mentally unstable guy. I and mean, if someone comes on the subway and says something like that, yeah, you, you, you could tell right away that they're not all there. I and mean, maybe that does make you more scared, but um, does it justify choking someone to death? You know, I don't think so. Right. And uh, according to to uh, a passenger that was on the train, he's, he, the passenger said the guy began to say a somewhat aggressive speech saying he was hungry, he was thirsty, that he didn't care about anything. He didn't care about going to jail. He didn't care that he gets a big life sentence. Um, but there's no info on what prompted, um, what was his name? Uh, Peely? Penny? Yeah. There's, there's not, no, nothing that, that I've seen that says what prompted him to actually step up and grab him in a chokehold. I mean, if the guy, we, we've all seen it on the train, someone yeah. walking up and down, like losing their stuff or talking to themselves or something like that. But what prompted this guy to stand up and and physically uh, grab him and put him in a chokehold? It was was he lunged at? Was he attacked? Was someone else attacked? None of that seems to have been uh, reported by, by anyone. Right. That or was it just the words? And you know, as scary as those words are in New York City, I've actually heard people say things like that before. And yeah. and you know, you could you could gauge how serious you think it is depending on the situation, but. Um, a friend of mine once went to a, a bar, actually, to watch a Yankees playoff game. But he was from Boston. He was in, in school from Boston. And he made the mistake of wearing a Red Sox hat at this bar. And, of course, Yankees fans don't like Red Sox fans. I think some take it more seriously than others. Apparently, a guy at the bar in New York told him something. You know, when, he, when he saw the guy in his Red Sox hat, he said something like, you know, I, I, I just got out of jail and I'm not afraid to go back. Something, something along those lines, which kind of sounds like a vague threat of violence, but I don't really think he felt that he was in direct danger. It was uncomfortable, certainly, but I don't yeah. think, he, I don't think it was really, in, I, think, I think they kind of both understood that the guy wasn't about to kill him, but it's still something that certainly makes you uneasy to hear. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, we're going to have to see and more info is going to come out. It's um, like you said, all the video footage so far has just been once the chokehold has been applied, um, nothing beforehand so we'll have to see hopefully like i said yeah and you know and and the question then also is okay let's say there was no physical initiation by neely right let's say it was just words the question is what were the exact words and also how are they said right because if it was something that could credibly be construed as a death threat and if you really thought people really thought that he was about to kill someone then you can defend against that. Now, again, does that justify killing a person? That's another story. But um, right. as far as just physically subduing him, right? physically um, holding him down for authorities to arrive, yeah, you would have to ask, did his actions uh, constitute a crime in the first place? And really a violent crime. If you're talking about a citizen's arrest, right? Did that justify um, holding him back until the police arrived with physical force? Right. And that's really a separate question. I mean, you know, these things can become related, but that's a separate inquiry as to whether he should have held him down even after he passed out. I mean, that that one is really hard for anyone, I think, to justify. 
Right. And that's, that's, I think that's, I keep sticking to that point. It's like, once he's passed out, situation's done. Like, you know, like you should have eased up. You're no longer in danger, right? I mean, right. what right. is the possible defense to that? It's just try to play devil's advocate. What's he going to say? Well, I was afraid he was going to come to and, and come back. I mean, but you don't have to keep your arm around his neck. Right. You can loosen the, the, the chokehold. Right. You're in the position yeah. still. Neck is clear. You're still holding him for police if that's what, what the situation called for. What, what possessed you to keep holding that deadly hold and you know for 15 minutes you know and and you know what it does so yeah well that's that's we'll we'll see where that goes from there yeah yeah you know and i think it's telling that it wasn't another passenger it wasn't a non-marine passenger who applied this chokehold it was a guy who knew how to do it right who, who thought to do it even right it was the guy who had training evidently in that technique and right. so he was the one who actually did it because he knew how to do it. Well, if you're the guy who does it because you know how to do it, then you should also know how to let go and not kill somebody with it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So. Well, we did mention uh, you did want to mention the uh, I guess the writer strike that's going on right now. Yeah. Yeah. And. Before that, though, oh no, go ahead. myself for a second. I'll get get before that. I, I was just going to say before that we should probably, at least I would like to celebrate that uh, Trump was found liable and Santos is being charged by the Justice Department. I'm feeling I'm feeling a little bit of uh, optimism wash over me in an otherwise non optimistic landscape. You did mention that at the start, though. So we're doing this. Yeah, I know, but I, it just it just, just bringing it back. It just, needed back to be said again. it just needed to be said again. Yeah, and you know, maybe next week or in the future we'll be able to get into these other stories more. We only have so right. much time tonight, but right. yeah, we did want to talk about the writer strike. Um, a lot of the information we saw on it was a little bit vague, to be honest yeah. with you. But I think it relates a little bit to what we have been talking about on here in terms of the changing entertainment industry, right? And the challenges associated with that. Of course, we've talked about AI a number of times and AI really is a part of this. We've also talked about streaming and in particular how it relates to music, but how you need what, 1500 plays now to equal what one sale used to be and how that kind of changed the whole financial model of music. Absolutely. Similar is happening with, uh, with TVs and movies, right? Where you just stream now on Netflix or whatever your streaming platform is. And that's changing the model and it's, it's affecting the pay structure and the writers are feeling it. Right. Um, so they voted to, to, to strike and this is going to affect apparently, I mean, it will affect everyone. If, if no one's writing, there's not going to be anything produced. And I think a couple of shows have already been postponed because of it. Um, and so, like I said, what we were reading it, it is a bit, a bit vague. They're saying, yeah, that uh, streaming is the cause of it. And they're concerned about AI, but they're not telling what streaming is the cause of. Um, now, what it, it did say... Well, well, hold on a second. Did we see something about residuals? Part of, part of it with, resi with residuals, part of it was um, with, st with streaming, you had, or with regular writing, you'd have seasons of, of shows that would go like 20 some episodes, right? So a writer would have pretty much guaranteed work for, you know, 10 months, a, a, a year. Um, but with streaming, typically shows uh, have like 10 episode, eight episode seasons. So they're not getting much work now. They're getting shorter, you know, shorter time, work time. Um, so that's one issue. Another part was that, Writers would get some sort of residuals in, in syndication, which was kind of a cash, not a cash cow, but it was some way for them to get continued payment for their work. And syndication would typically happen, what was it, after like four seasons. But with streaming, the shows that they're writing for stay on the streaming platform and they're not going into syndication. So they're losing out on that extra stream of income so that was another complaint that they were that they were having um Wait a minute. I'm, I'm trying to understand that point so before streaming when shows were in syndication 
residuals started after four seasons? That's what it looked like it said. Like, typically, if it was a, they would go after four seasons, they'd start getting, it could go into, I guess it could go into syndication or, or they would get residuals after four seasons or, or something in that regard. And now, because they're on there forever, they don't it's get that them. syndication. It's, it's, it's not only on there forever, but it's on that platform only. Right. Oh, so with syndication, okay. with, with shows and syndication, right. they, could they, go, sold, they go out to the networks. Right? Rights could be sold to different type of platforms. You know, someone might pick it up here and then if they didn't want to run it, they, they'd run it over somewhere else. And so there was potential for these different contracts to be done and for these residuals to be paid out. But if it's going to do a, you're doing a show on Netflix, it's going to sit on Netflix and only be on Netflix. There's no other negotiation contract. There's nothing. And so writers are missing out on an uh, income stream that they had relied on for, for decades. Now, it doesn't say that this is just regarding streaming, though. Those network shows and those network things are still there. I think on the opposite side, uh, and it was even brought up, is that what streaming did was bring up extra writing opportunities, right? Because people were vying for the, the network jobs before, and then there, when there wasn't streaming, they were vying for these network jobs. And so there was m limited jobs. What streaming did was bring more jobs around, but it seems to be at less pay and at less residual opportunities. And so th I think they're wanting it to be comparable or at least a little bit fairer in regards to what would happen in uh, network writing. However, you look at the other side and you're like, well, if streaming wasn't there, you wouldn't get this anyway. So yeah. that's probably one thing that they're looking at. Another thing was the rates haven't changed since 2018. So they're still getting paid the same rates that were done in 2018, which when you factor in cost of living, it becomes a 14% decrease in, in their pay. And so that was another and then, issue. Yeah. And then also, I think there was concern that AI was going to start taking their jobs. Yeah, AI is, is another concern that, um, that they have. And so they want to bring into the language of the negotiation that, you know, AI can't basically can't be a part of, uh, of these writers rooms or, or, or whatnot, because they're worried about them taking their jobs. Now, that I don't see how they can really negotiate that. It's like saying, telling the studios, oh, you're not allowed to use AI. You have to hire uh, human writers. Why can't like, they say that, though? I mean, it, it kind of reminds me. I understand there might be some logistical challenges in that, but it reminds me of what we talked about earlier with the bill to require Congress people to write their own stuff. I mean, yes, yeah, like how can you really enforce that if, some, if, if someone hands you something that was already halfway written? I think but, it's I mean, why can't though. that still be a baseline? Why can't that just be in the contract? I think that's different, though. Like with the Congress member, like that's your job. <laughs> your job is to do that. With the writer's uh, job is to write, isn't it? Well, writer's job is to write. But the producer of the show's job isn't to hire the writer. The producer of the show's job is to get the show produced. And to get if the they're going to hire the writer, the writer wants to know they're being paid to write. And <laughs> but if the producer decides they want to use AI to write it, why why should there be a law in place that says they can't use AI and they have well, it's to not, hire it's not a law, it will be part of the contract that they're negotiating. Part of the negotiation, right. Yeah. So that that's where I see I'm wondering how they're going to how they're going to play that, right? I I think human writers still should be in, in place. We're gonna get much better um content that way. Um and it's better for the jobs and for the community and for the arts community. In general, but I'm just wondering how they're going to say, be able to put that in the contract and say, well, you're not allowed to use it at all. Should that be the poll question? Should AI write the poll question for us? That's too complicated right now. <laughs> that would be funny. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy in the chat said that's like saying no self checkout at the grocery. I mean, it's kind of a similar point. You know, like, because if you do enough self checkout, then you don't need cashiers. So they're taking their jobs. That's something a union would probably try to negotiate, right? Yeah. And say, well, you're not allowed to have self-checkout lines. Yeah. Or yeah. limit the amount or what have you. Right. So, I mean, 
yeah, it's just, it's it's gonna be interesting how they how they pull that off. So you know what? Just in case, why don't we ask yeah. Chat GPT to write us a few poll questions on this? So okay. this is about another AI. This is kind of like a meta game we're playing, right? Well, maybe instead of Chat GPT, go to I don't know if you have the latest Bing or the latest Edge, and then you go to oh. Bing Chat. Because they have access to, um, I'm on. Wait, hold on a second. Oh, I'm don't on tell Chrome. me you're on a Mac. No, I'm on Google Chrome. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, Google Chrome. Okay. Let okay. me see. Um, do I have? Oh, I got Edge. I'm, I never really use it though. Let me see. Well, Edge um, has incorporated GPT four. Okay. Where do I go? I'm on Edge right now. Uh, there should be a uh, go to bing.com. Uh, ask me anything. Okay. And you see the chat, um, chat, chat link, yeah. click that. And that should bring up. And that should bring oh, up. The, okay. Here we go. Write me some nuanced poll questions. I just use perplexity to write it. And I, I've got a bunch of, I got a couple of them here as well. Do you think the WGA writer strike will have potentially devastating effects on writers in the industry? Eh. Do you think producers are well are well able to compensate writers more fairly? Yeah, that's not a very good one. See, I actually am telling it to do some background on the nuanced podcast with Mike Scott and Jay Carter. I don't know if that's going to help it in any way, but maybe it'll come up with a better poll question. Given how about how about if we ask about if these studios should be restricted um, from using AI to write. That was the whole question that I was thinking of originally. I just wanted to know if it was going to come up with something more interesting, but yeah, the, the question that it came up with was, do you support the 2023 Writers Guild of America strike? I mean, pretty generic, but. Should AI be allowed to write shows? Should AI be allowed to write um, I guarantee you people are going to say yes on, on that. We'll can put it out I don't there. know. I don't know. Lixa just sent me that, um, I guess, using chat GPT. We've got another chat GPT user in the place. Um, but I think that's, you know what? We're, gonna, we're coming up on this where this is going to be a question that, that's going to be asked in a lot of industries. Right. Absolutely. And, and by the way, here we go. So not only did this give us a question, which was kind of on the generic side, but it gave us choices. Now, usually our choices are just yes or no, but it said here, yes, I think writers deserve fair compensation and job security for their work. No, I think writers are asking for too much and hurting the industry, or I don't know enough about the issue to have an opinion. No one chooses that though, <laughs> even though they should. Right. Well, I, <laughs> Everyone I, has I, an opinion. I asked it to write five yes, no poll questions about, about the strike. And then it gave her huh. yes, no questions. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that. I said, give it, maybe, maybe given, given the, the writer strike, do you, given the concerns of the writer strike about AI, do you think AI should be allowed to write uh, TV shows and movies, something like it, write scripts? Or should studios be allowed to use AI to write scripts at the expense of writers? Yeah. Oh, here you go. It just came up with that question. Okay. What's the question say? <laughs> well, I actually read, came up with a few questions, but this one says, do you think artificial intelligence should be used in the writing process? Yes, I think artificial intelligence can be a useful tool for research or generating ideas. But no, I think artificial intelligence can replace human creativity and originality. Okay, so let's let's, let's target that towards the the what's going on right now with the yeah. uh, the strike. So, um, let me take a stab at it then. Um, okay, given the concerns of the, the writers with the writer's strike, do you think that artificial intelligence should be used in the writing process? How about that? 
Yeah. I like it. And like you said, it's going to be hard to keep artificial intelligence out of anything. Oh, it, it's and people are going to sneak it in, right? Even if it's officially barred, it's like, well, how, how do they know? We just take one hit of AI on this, right? <laughs> <laughs> one, one hit of AI? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, just one puff won't hurt anybody. I just need a little bit. I just need a little bit. Yeah. No, it's it's going to be, it's everywhere. Listen, it's, it's, you know, and then, you know, now with the rise of stuff like auto GPT, um, it's on steroids now. Um, I'll be honest. So I've not used, I don't plan on using AI, chat GPT, anything for lyric writing, right? I write my oh. own lyrics, but I have run my lyrics through chat GPT for kicks to, and asked it like, do these lyrics make sense? Or, you know, what do you get out of this? It's just to kind of get its, it's sense of it and i've taken some suggestions into account I'll, I'll be honest like sometimes it says hey that one line seems a little unclear and i was like you know what maybe it's right <laughs> you know yeah if you're using it in that way you know and, and there was actually one thing that you put me on to that you put lyrics in there and asked what do these lyrics mean and it, yeah and it, I, I do that it's to actually see if pretty it good metaphors. yeah it's actually pretty good at picking it up it's pretty on good it. And then I think, okay, well, if it understands it, then there's something there that it, it's not, it's not something that only I'm going to get. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, all right. So that's, a, that's a, the poll question of the week. All right. Um, you know, I think, I don't think you can stop it. I, I think it's going to be, it's going to be there. You can't stop it. It's going to be everywhere. Um, and it's getting, it's only going to get better. And it's only going to get, I think, what was it recently? They did something where they, um, something was released with uh, chat GPT that was able to do um, analysis at a very high level, data analysis. And so that was the next thing people were concerned about, data analysis jobs. Oh, wow. Look at this. So Lixa just sent me a message here. She was using chat GPT to generate a poll question. Yeah. Her poll question was exactly the same as this other engine that you had put me onto. That's interesting. I'm guessing it's, it must be using some of the same algorithms, right? Well, well, being in, and Microsoft is using the GPT algorithm. Oh, so it is they, using GPT. So it's using GPT yeah. plus the ability to research. Through right, Bing. right. Yeah. Okay, because it wasn't just the same poll question. It was the same choices as well. Word right. for word, the same. Yeah, so, oh, really? That's interesting. Yeah. 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 So it uses it, it. Microsoft has heavily invested in in the company OpenAI, and they've been integrated um, ChatGPT functionality into to Bing and into the Edge browser, so that they can put AI and search together to try to get an edge over Google. And that's what's got Google really shaken uh, in their boots because they don't have that. And then Google put out there is Bard which is just horrible. Um, and so, yeah, they're really, they're really going to be playing catch up. Wow. Well, this is hitting the world so fast, right? Like it just came out, what was it, December? The, the chat GPT anyway. And it's like, you know, not everyone is on it for everything. <laughs> um, absolutely. Yeah. We're, we're going to, we're going to, and it's going to get, it's going to get worse. It's going to yeah. get better. I mean, as far as capability. You get better or, or worse, depending on your perspective, right? Right, right, right. So what is the bottom line? I mean, I think the bottom line is hold on to the glimmers of hope that we have and appreciate the progress that we do see. Not everything is a positive, and we oftentimes do see setbacks, as I sound like a damn preacher <laughs> saying this, but this is what I took from the episode anyway, that, you know, there are these glimmers of hope and there is this progress and we're, we have a lot to celebrate and a lot to be thankful for. We also have a lot to catch up on. Um you know, I guess we got to take the good with the bad in life and hope the good outweighs the bad. And similar to what I was saying last week, was try to maximize these positive moments that we have, not just in our own lives, but in the world and minimize the negative, knowing it's never quite going to be perfect, but we're striving to make it better. Absolutely. And I think it's also important to notice that sometimes this progress and these steps towards take time. Yeah. And yeah. we should we should be aware of that. And in the meantime, if you do need a will, <laughs> <laughs> let me know by, by, by the way so i got this in my mailbox earlier if you guys got it 
If you live in Howard Beach, Ozone Park, or Woodhaven, and you received it, let me know because everyone was supposed to get one of these. Now let me let me ask you: it, Does yeah. it have your Instagram on there? It does. Okay, so so all right, so you were able to get the 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 one when I sent it the second time. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because I remember and, when I sent it, I first, the second one they said was a million times better than the first, but the only difference was the Instagram. So I guess it made that much of a difference. All right. And honestly, look, and, and we had this conversation. I don't really want people. I mean, if you do, it's fine. I would prefer you email me if it's about right. law, right? If it's about a will or an, any legal issue, I think email is the best place for it. It's really not convenient for me to have these messages all over my different inboxes. So I don't really want people to Instagram me about this. I mean, I prefer the email. Like I said, if you do fine, I'll, I'll hopefully see it, but Really, it's just um, if I'm going to send this to everyone, I figure I might as well put my social media on there so people can follow me and keep up with what I'm doing. Well, here's the thing is if if you got that in the mail and you saw it, go to Mike's Instagram and at least leave a comment on mm. on that post because you've also posted it on your Instagram. I posted it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. So go there, leave a comment, be like, you know, I saw it or something like that. So, I got it in the mail. Yeah. Yeah, I got it in the mail. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. All right. There it is. And of course, where can people find us? They can find us on YouTube at Nuance Show. And uh, they get the replays of everything that we've talked about here and previously. Uh, you can also jump on over to Instagram at Nuance Show also. And then, of course, when you're doing podcasts, check us out anywhere podcasts are. Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, and YouTube podcasts as well. So, um, And anywhere else. So. Go subscribe, go leave comments, go fight in the chat rooms and, and all of that good stuff. There it is. And as always, we've got work to do. We will catch you next week. Thank you all.